Welcome to PCB Chat, where we talk with experts across the printed circuit design, manufacturing, and electronic supply chain fields. I'm Mike Buto, editor in chief of PCDNF and Circuits Assembly. First, a word from today's sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by the Printed Circuit Engineering Professional, a new five day course covering basics of the printed circuit design profession. The program is vendor agnostic and was developed by experts with a combined 250 years of electronics and printed circuit design experience. The course includes a 400 page workbook and an optional certification recognized by the Printed Circuit Engineering Association. For more information, contact info at pce-edu.com. My guest today is Wally Rines on behalf of the ESD Alliance. Wally, as you may know, is a regular on PCB Chat. He has spent 45 years in semiconductor and PCB design, including 25 years as Chief Executive of Mentor. Wally, it's uh, great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Mike. I hope you are as well. We are. We are. Just got back from our PCB West show, and so it was good to be back in person with uh, design engineers from from all over the place, uh, mostly North America this time. You know, the travel restrictions kind of kept some folks from from making it to Santa Clara, but for the most part, it, it felt pretty normal. Great to hear. So we are going to talk today about uh, the second calendar quarter EDA results. Uh, what do you have for us? Boy, it was a dynamite quarter for PCB. Uh, Extremely strong number, strongest one we've seen in quite a while. Came in uh, in total for uh, printed circuit board, uh, was up 16.8% versus the prior year. And it was in double digits in every region of the world. Uh, That's unlike all the other normal categories of uh, reporting for uh, design automation statistics, with the exception of the non-reporting companies in the intellectual property business. This was uh, the only one that was strong in every country, including Japan, which has been relatively weak in IC design. So uh, a really great quarter. Let's talk about Japan a little bit. I, I noticed that it did do very well in PCB in Q2, especially you know relative to the other regions. It's been a bit of a weak sister for for quite a while, and uh, you know the other geographies tend to uh, be doing better, even though you still see a lot of semi firms and and you know blue chip OEMs in Japan. Uh, what what do you make of that? Well, there's nothing in our statistics report that gives much insight. Uh, in general, though, the Japanese economy has a lot of systems companies, automotive companies in particular, that you know continue uh, to design things uh, right through uh, any weakness in supply chain or recession or pandemic. Uh, the design activity tends to be fairly steady, and uh, I think. Uh, worldwide, there seems to be a lot of demand on the system side. Uh, uh, the uh, people at Siemens tell me that we're looking at 550 companies that are developing electric cars and light trucks around the world. And uh, uh, then we've got a lot of other uh, subsystem designs for the Internet of Things and so on. So uh, uh, we always see more stability in system design than we do in chip design. But we always see more stability in design than we do in manufacturing and distribution. Good news if you're in the PCB design business. And I would like to uh, sort of carry that over to the the IC fab starts, right? And we're seeing quite a bit of activity in the U.S. It all seems pretty exciting. I don't recall a time where there was so much national interest in, in semiconductors. Do you? No, I, I really don't. Of course, this is a mixed blessing when the U.S. government gets interested in your business, but uh, <laughs> uh, I I can't remember one uh, quite like this as far back as when the their trade wars uh, emerged in semiconductors with Japan, and Japan embarked on a program to try to buy more semiconductors from U.S. companies to ease the tensions uh, with some degree of success. So it's been a long time. There clearly is a lot of attention. And there is a lot of pressure on manufacturers, particularly the front end manufacturers, wafer fab, to increase their capacity. So big commitments have been announced and uh, lots of uh, money is pouring into it. That's normal when you've had a period of time where you're investing at a little bit low, lower than the long term average. 
but usually uh, these things do come in balance. I think the thing that's different here, uh, well, especially different, is that we have shortages throughout the back end supply chain, everything from substrates uh, through assembly and test. And so the bottlenecks are much more than just wafer fabs, and uh, that affects the PCB business as well. But usually, we don't seem to see much effect on the design uh, flow. Uh, overall, the number of designs uh, tends to increase at a, a pretty steady rate. And uh, as these new fabs, on, fabs come online, of course, they'll produce more chips, uh, more variants. That requires more PCB design. And uh, so we'll have some good effects out of that, I think. Do you see a correlation really between PCB revenue and the other uh, categories that, that attract? It's very modest. There are the general effects of recessions that cause some decrease in design activity or an increase afterwards. But PCB has been somewhat uncorrelated with IC in recent years. IC design has held pretty steady over the last 10 years, whereas PCB in the uh, first five years of the last decade was in its traditional path and mid single digits and in the last half of the decade has been uh, averaging uh, double digits. So we've come into an era of increased system design and the numbers today would and also last quarter would say that that seems to be continuing. Interesting. It looks like employment saw a really big jump, a 7% over a year ago, almost 2%, you know, sequentially. I mean, <laughs> yeah. EDAC yeah. is hard enough to stop. <laughs> so in my 25-year uh, oh, history of reporting these numbers, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a decrease. Merlin <laughs> may have, but so it always increases some, but a 7.3%, that's a lot. And that's that's the employment by companies that provide EDA products and services. So uh, it can't, uh, over any long term, grow faster than the revenue of the industry. Uh, and, of course, a 7% increase versus an industry going 14% uh, is actually not that uh, extraordinary. Uh, but uh, I would think 7% long term is a pretty big number. You did mention the, uh, you know, the supply chain issues. When it comes to new program starts and possibly additional seat and related maintenance, can we read much into what's going on right now uh, on the on an industry level, uh, and and maybe project a little bit into how that will play out on the uh, on the EDA side? Uh, that's very hard. Uh, I think one of the things that we have emphasized over the years is that design has a life of its own. Really, uh, it's affected much less by recessions than all the other categories, manufacturing, support, so on, because people tend to design products at about the same rate, even when the economy is not looking too good. Uh, there's some variation, but it's a pretty stable part of the industry, especially when you look at all the other expense categories in the semiconductor and system industry. So uh, it does fluctuate. And I think uh, I, I'm hoping that the supply chain issues and other things you talk about are relatively short term, no more than a year or two. And uh, people have to continue to develop products, even if they can't ship them all to their customers or get them manufactured. They still have to progress forward. And that's really a great strength of EDA. It has a great deal of stability. Uh, this may be digging a little bit into the into the weeds, and and you might not be able to address this. But I'm wondering if the ESD Alliance tries to track the amount of revenue per seat, or comes up with any type of metric like that. We don't, and uh, there's some reasons for that. One is that uh, the number of sales that are on a per seat basis uh, has varied greatly over the years. So uh, there's a large share of the software that is sold independent of number of seats or maybe only in aggregate uh, uh, based upon uh, available licenses that can float and be used uh, by different people around the world. Merlin probably has some statistics on number of designers in the world, and you can use that to uh, infer what the cost per seat is. 
And uh, I don't, uh, I think our, our PCB designers are pretty numerous. Uh, yeah, Merlin, you might have a comment. Those numbers haven't been updated for a while and certainly not part of uh, ESDA, but they're significant and, and they are growing, uh, of course, with the activity in China, especially. So that would say that the cost per seat, it may be coming down substantially. We don't really know the exact numbers. And also when you go and try to survey that kind of data, it's hard to get a consistency you can trust. Okay. Well, I mean, congratulations to the industry on a, another sterling quarter. And, you know, it must be fun to be the uh, spokesperson when uh, you get to report on numbers like this. Nice to report on good news, Mike. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Wally, for making the time to talk with us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks also to our sponsor, the Printed Circuit Engineering Professional, the only PCB design training curriculum developed by industry experts and recognized by the Printed Circuit Engineering Association. For information, contact info at pce-edu.com. This is Mike Buto for PCB Chat. Have a nice day. Mm-hmm.